as we go beyond the garden, I began to go to the Father and I said, Lord, what would you have for me to minister on this particular Sunday? And the Lord uh, began to take me to the particular passage, which is Philippians 4 and 8. And before I am able to give our theme for this morning, I want us to turn there together so that we can read the word. And once we have read the word, we're going to get right into what the Lord is ministering to the house on this morning. Amen. Again, that's Philippians, the fourth chapter and the eighth verse. The scripture reads as follows. Say amen when you have it. You know, I move fast. My God. If you need, if you're waiting on it, if I need to wait on you, say, wait on me. All right. So that means everybody got the word. Hallelujah. So the scripture reads, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. As I begin to go to this particular passage and as we're talking about going beyond the garden, the Lord ministered to me that the reason why us as a people can't get beyond on the garden is because somehow our mind has been stuck on some things from the past. Somehow we're unable to position our perception and position our minds to think on these things that are honest and pure. And the reason why we cannot get there is because we are paralyzed. And I know you are like, woman of God, what in the world are you talking about? How in the world can I be paralyzed? Does anybody know what it means to have this type of disability where it has stuck your growth. It has basically led your life into absolutely nothing. You get up every day doing absolutely everything. It has restricted your mobility. And so that's why this is why you cannot grow. This is why you cannot keep going. This is why relationships continues to fail because we have been paralyzed in our mind. And if we don't get a hold of that thing, then we cannot accomplish the things that God had intended for us because why in the world would God give you anything that your your mind cannot handle because once he puts you in a particular position he's expecting you to go somebody say go somebody say go Somebody believe that they woke up this morning for themselves. Somebody believe that they're going on their job for themselves. But I want to remind you on this morning that God has placed some great things inside of you for you to be able to go. And in order for you to go, you got to change the way you think. And in order for us to change the way we think, we got to begin to put these things on the forefront of our minds. We got to start thinking things that are honest. We got to start thinking things that are pure. We got to start thinking things that are just and thinking things that are lovely we gotta start thinking these things that they may be oh my gosh of a good report we got to do it somebody say I have got to do it oh y'all don't believe this somebody say I have got to do it that's it. I got to change the way I think. I got to begin to put these things on my mind. I got to stop thinking that I am little. I got to stop thinking that I am nothing. I got to stop thinking that the purpose that God has given me is not meant for nobody and cannot help anybody else. Because until I change the way I think, I cannot obtain the thing that God has in store for me. So this is why when we are doing the work in love, all of you see all you see are the offenses because those things our mind the way our mind is conditioned the only thing that we can see is offense rather than love the only thing that we can see is offense that's why we can't grow so it is that as we're going beyond the garden what we are reminded is is Genesis the first chapter and the 26th verse what we realize here is that and Adam is given some sort of mandate then God said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on this earth even though we're living in this fallen world even though there's destruction all around us even though that there's chaos and corruptions and confusion
confusion on our jobs, even possibly in our homes, in our family dynamics, it still requires a responsibility to exercise the dominion that God has intended for you to do so. And I know you say that I know that there's something that God has called me to, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what God is requiring of me, but I want to remind you on this morning that everybody that is connected to the Father, every child of God, amen, is responsible for the dominion that God has in store, that the dominion that God has intended for us to accomplish is meant to honor God. Are you with me this morning? And so if it is that we are in his likeness of God, we are designed to show up in this fallen world to show what God is like. So when we when God gave us the command to rule over the earth, the expectation was to do so in a way that reflected his character. What's happening today is that a lot of us are showing up in our marriages reflecting the character of God. A lot of us are not showing up in ministry, in, in our jobs. Amen. In our families, my God, reflecting, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus, reflecting the character of God. Because God expected us, just as he did with Adam, to work it and watch over it. That whatever it is that God has given you, this dominion is meant for us to work it, cultivate it, fill it, and name it. But a lot of us are afraid. That's why we cannot get to the place where we begin to name what our destiny should look like this is why we can't get to a place where we mount up and go up and go out like leaders who God has called us to be because we're always contemplating on things and the flaws that we have in our life you're worried about how you speak how you sound you're worried about how you dress you're worried about how you look you you compare yourself to everybody else what the Lord ministered to me some time ago is to shut off social media so for two years I came off of social media because you well, my God the enemy will try to stumble you he will try to make you feel like it's important for you to compare yourself to your neighbor and this is why it is important for you to center your thoughts with God because if you center your thoughts with God then you will get a revelation of who you are supposed to be who are you supposed to show up in this world because a lot of us are showing up as our neighbor and not who God has told us to be we're looking like something but we're not really who God wants us to be we act like it but we're not who God who's supposed to want us to be we try to impress our neighbors but we're not who God has called us to be God somebody said God called me to dominion so if we are called to fill the earth, we are called to fill the earth to give glory back to the God. So if our father is a type of God who has created a thing and we were created in his image and there was male and then there was female, then indeed he has created us as his representatives to also create some things. My God, can you ask yourself, have I created anything lately? Mm, this is a question that we should ask ourselves because as we're moving, as we live in this world, there are some things that we should be creating. There are some things that we should be forming. There are some things that the things that we are creating and forming should be an image and a reflection of who God is. And this thing should also bring glory back to God. And so it is that we get to a place where us as believers, we shy away from the specific call of dominion. So, so most of us are so busy trying to tell someone else how they should run their life. We're so busy trying to figure out what somebody else's assignment. Isn't it funny, Sister Amy, that some people can tell you what your assignment is, but they still don't know what their assignment is? Isn't it funny that you can tell somebody how they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to operate as pastors, how they're supposed to operate as members? but they cannot operate and control and manage their own lives. And this is where it is where us as people have to get to a place where we stop looking at someone else's life, trying to manage and control their lives and try to control the thing that God gave them. And we look at our lives and we manage, oh my God, that we manage and we control the thing that God has given us. Somebody says, God called me to dominion. So the theme that we have on this morning 
is paralyzed by rebellion. We've been paralyzed for too long by rebellion. What does that look like? What does that mean? What does that sound like? That there are some things that God had intended for you to do. There are some things that God has placed in your spirit to do. But instead, you wanted to do the things that you wanted to do. So instead, you said to yourself, that's too hard to do. I don't have enough money to go. I don't have enough things. I'm not smart enough. I don't look like them. And so you belittled yourself when God told you, come on, Moses, I hear you. Moses had a speech impediment and so he wanted to know why in the world would God call him to do the work the reason why God would use your disability is because God knows that he can get my God God knows that he can get the glory out of what you see flow in and that's all right if you can't keep up with your speech that's all right that every now and then you stumble over your words that's all right you're not as tall as them my God that's all right because God wants to use that very thing to get the glory out of your life life and so it is when we're talking about being paralyzed by rebellion we have to take ourselves back to be the before the garden of Eden my God and in the garden of Eden we know that Adam and Eve they rebelled against the orders of God what is it that you have rebelled against what is it that God gave you control over that God gave you the authority over but yet and still you rebelled against that thing. And as I began to think about this particular message on this morning, God reminded me, myself, the assignment that God had given me. Sometimes people of God, I wanted to stop by this morning just to let you know that sometimes we can be looking at other people and those things be the things that scare us from going on the path that God has called us to go to. But what the Lord reminded me that me and Pastor Corey, have the ability and the authority and dominion to do the work that God has called us to do when we came together. So whatever God had given him as an assignment when he was a single man and God gave me as a single woman, we came together and now that assignment has to make sense because we still got a work that we got to fulfill. With that being said, we understand here that even as shepherds here at Alto Worship Center, we can't even allow our mess. We can't even allow insecurities. We can't allow absolutely nothing to stop us from doing the work that God has called us to do and this is what I want to challenge you on this morning to understand that you ought to not let nothing and nobody and nothing to stop you from doing the thing that God has called and ordained you to do and so I begin to study and ask God God if you've given us this assignment what in the world are we as people have to do exactly and God reminded me that you are shepherds and so us as shepherds we are required amen to not, we are, your lives the blood of your life if we don't if we, we withhold this word of God that word my God the blood is required on our hands that we are considered to be shepherds and overseers of those that God has placed there that we are to keep fuck by night my God can I go scripture with you guys that we got to gather you up as lambs and place you in our bosom we got to cry out we got to give an account we got we have to responsibility and the assignment to do the work that God has called us to be and even though we're not the type of people that have to rebuke a man like the apostle right but God says I'm also giving you the authority to do the very same thing because you have the responsibility to make sure and ensure that my people don't become the stiff neck generation that we don't look like the untoward generation that we don't look like the type of people who are willful meaning that we're, we're so focused on deliberately and intentionally trying to be evil that we're not showing some type of signs of stubbornness and amen to not do the things regardless of what we know we should be doing and so it is that us as individuals if there is something that is in you my god it's our job to pull that thing out of you somebody say i won't be the perverse generation I won't be the stiff neck generation. It's our job to ensure that we take you from not only just getting the milk, but you also get to the meat. It's our job to make sure that we leave the 99 and go after the one. It's our job to make sure that we teach you the rules of God and that you may obey his statutes. It's our job to reveal the mysteries of the gospel so that you may become wise of the devil, my God. It's our job to lay down our 
life for the sheep. And so it is that is our particular opportunity that me learning this when I served under the apostle, I said to myself that I don't need a friend. I don't need you to be my best friend, but I need to be corrected. I need you, God, hallelujah, to do what you said you were going to do for me. And in order for us to receive what we need to get from God, we got to, my God, we got to be able to break that thing of rebellion. How many of you in here can attest that I've rebelled against some things that God told me to do? So some of us aren't willing to be honest. Some of us aren't willing to admit, but I need God to deliver me here because there's not enough. My God, somebody say it stops here. Somebody say it stops here. My children won't walk in this world and live this world as rebellion. I said to myself, God, you won't bring another child in this world that will, my God, be rebelling against the faith, my God. And so it is that you got to make up in your mind that you won't be able to be the type of person where you rebel against what God is telling you to do. That there's a type of authority that you have. But this authority that God has given you, you cannot fully walk into it until you have accepted the fact that God I need you to deliver me from this rebellion state of me rebellion meaning stepping away trying to uh, purposely go against something that you know is right it is re re our responsibility to understand what being paralyzed by rebellion really looks like if you could take a good look at your life in this particular message I had to take a good look at my life and I had to see how in the world am I being paralyzed by rebellion because there is nothing that's good that can come from rebellion. When you think about rebellion, you think about the dark things, you think about the evil things, you think about the wicked things. And all of these things that comes from this spirit of rebellion keeps you further away from God. And there's, it serves us no purpose, my God, to come to the house of God when we're not trying to get close to God. It serves us no purpose to pray to the father when we're tr not trying to get close to God so this authority that God will remind us is that my, the Bible says Luke 10 and 19 my God behold I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you the reason why many of us are walking and we're living this life like we have been hurt because in fact we have already accepted it so you don't want to walk around in this life as you're a hurt because God says you have the authority to tread over these certain things. You have the authority that anytime they try to come against you, it won't harm you. It won't affect you. They might be doing it in your face, but it won't harm you. Somebody say, I'm protected. The Bible says you are giving him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Romans 6 and 14 says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Meaning this dominion that God is expecting from us is meant for us to understand that it won't, it won't rule us. It won't control us. Sin, if you're in a position in your life and sin is ruling you, it's controlling you, you've got to have that you got to say Lord deliver me because we know for a fact what God is expecting from us Adam and Eve they died because of the fall but the fall didn't just affect them it also affected generations after them but the good thing about the Lord somebody say God is still good the good thing about the Lord is that sin what it did was it caused hardship for us all so we all still have to endure hardship because of something that Adam and Eve did but the fact that they did it did not stop what God will continue to do even here to this day because what he did was he said I don't want my people to have a punishment for something that they did not do so what he began to do is send his only begotten son down to live on this earth to die and be crucified and get up on the third day and rose again and so when I think about what Jesus did for us my God surely I can give God truly what he deserved because what that means to me people of God is that if Jesus was able to do something and make a sacrifice as great as it was surely it meant that I us as individual will not have eternal consequences of sin somebody say I thank God for that so rebellion is an act of violent or open resistance to an established government or ruler. It's the action or process of resisting authority, control, or convention. 
To rebel is a person who rises in opposition or armed resistance against an establishment, government, or rule. Rebellion is the defiance or disobedience against authority. Since we're still talking about going beyond the garden, we're looking first at what Adam and Eve did. And before we can actually get beyond this, we have to realize that we need to ask God for some things. There are some of us that are going to God for something, but we need God to deliver us in a certain area of our lives so it no longer stunts our growth so it doesn't stop us from moving forward from where God wants us to be what rebellion does is it causes bitterness it causes an unpleasant spirit and this is why it's important for us to not take on these things and to overcome rebellion because when you turn away from something that God has given you you might think that oh I'm just gonna not do it now because I'm not ready I'm not gonna walk in the calling because I'm not ready I'm not gonna do it because I'm not ready you might be thinking that you're making an honest decision to do that but you're bringing on other spirits as a part of your life which is paralyzing you which is why you cannot continue to do the work that God has called you to do because you're still stuck you're always thinking about something how other people may appear you you're always thinking about something that you had done you're always thinking the wrong things remember we started off that we got to start thinking these things that are honest these things that are lovely these things that are just these things that are pure these things my God that brings about our virtue my God and of good report so what rebellion does is it translates as change or disobedient disobey provoke rebellious and rebel in the New Testament it talks about disobedience and undermining authority rebellion is simply the rejection of authority starting all the way back in Genesis the first chapter God gave man dominion over every living thing on the earth with this dominion God comes authority and responsibility that everything it is that God has given to you requires for you to have this type of authority and responsibility so you have to walk, you have to walk out this life. You have to leave here today understanding that whatever it is that God has imparted into you, it requires your responsibility. It requires your authority. You got to understand that when you, if you don't step into it, no one else will. You got to understand that God is ministering to you in this season for you to understand what dominion truly looks like. Because when we think about dominion, we automatically think about just the land and that maybe I'll get it or maybe not, but everything that it is that God has required of us meant for us to gain and have that particular control and manage the thing that God has given us so for the person who has dominion God by God they have the authority and responsibility to oversee and manage whenever is in their whatever is in their dominion for every living thing under this dominion comes respect submission to authority and accountability when there is rebellion against authority, then there is a rejection of the dominion given to the authority. So with this rejection comes rejection of what God has ordained. When you reject the things that God has imparted in you, it is you rejecting authority. And there's a consequence. Someone says a consequence for that. And there's a consequence to come with those things that you are rejecting. You're rebelling against the authority. It means that you're rebelling against God's authority. So sometimes I know it looks like that, well, I'm just not ready, so I'm going to make this honest decision to say I'm not going to go. But when God calls you to it, that means he knew you were ready for it. Somebody said God knows. And Romans 13, 1 through 7, I'm not going to read there, but I want us to understand this for this particular passage here. That God has given, if some of us, um, if there's one thing about a divine connection. And what God does is he sets up ministers for our lives to show us where we're supposed to go. And I know many of us like to run away from them because I was the number one. Amen. Amen. So does Sabrina remember being one? Amen. We run away from the authority. We run away from the authority figure that God has placed in our lives. But those particular people have the divine connection to connect with us and bring something out of us that have been laying dormant. So I know in you, you might feel like, well, I'm not ready 
made for this thing or I can't handle this thing or I'm not good enough for this thing. But sometimes the ministers, they can see something that you can't see in yourself. And most of the time that is the case. Sometimes they'll be able to say a word or just touch you and that will begin to bring you up to the standard in which you were supposed to be. And sometimes where it would take some people five years and 10 years, it'll only take you 30 days to a year. Amen. And so it is for this particular passage here. The, the, the man of God, he had a scripture on last week where he basically explained exactly what ministers can do. It is important for us to understand the authority that even on our jobs, I know many of us walk around like we, you know, we're God gifts from heaven and we know for a fact who we are. But you cannot go on your job trying to be the ruler. Amen. You got to submit. You got to respect to the authority. My God, this is the Sharice, my God. <laughs> we cannot, we cannot, we got to go on our jobs. And even though we don't think that they're right, even though we don't understand them, even though we think that they don't like us, whatever it is, we still got to submit because God had required for us to do so. So 1 Samuel 15, 23, the latter part of that particular passage says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. This is why we don't feel like the, the words when the pastors and the leaders are preaching this gospel. We don't feel like we are in the number because what has happened is because we have rejected the word, we turned around and now we don't feel like we are kings and like we're queens. We don't feel like we have the authority because of the things that we have been through in our lives but what rebellion, rebellion begins to do an evil man seeks only rebellion and a cruel messenger will be sent against him the bible tells us that rebellion against authority is rebellion against god it tells us that it exemplifies satan and then it turns around and tells us because it is a form of disobedience that is also witchcraft somebody say what witchcraft it's a form of witchcraft my God. And so the practice, it, it, rebellion is a practice of evil people. Rebellion results in the loss of blessings from God. Rebellion angers God and rebellion results in death. This is why if you are living, but your life doesn't look like you're prospering, if you're living and it doesn't look like you're producing anything, if you're living and it doesn't look like you're forming anything. It's because spiritually you are dead. It's because spiritually you are numb. If you don't get excited about the word of God, or if you don't get excited about coming to the house of God, there is something that has died. Somebody say, I need to be resurrected. Oh my God, we need to be able to make these things known before the Lord. We need to go honest before the Lord with our request so he can revive us again. Because every now and then this journey in life, it does get hard. It does become a little difficult. Sometimes you're dealing with people and you can't quite understand them. And those be the things that cripple us. But because God said you were so focused on the, what people were doing that you missed the move that I was trying to give you. You missed the movement so you my God you didn't have any mobility because you missed you were so focused on everything else around you everybody else's assignment that you missed what I was trying to tell you and so it is I asked the Lord Lord how in the world with us as individuals how can we get to the place if we are paralyzed by rebellion how can we be healed God how can we uh, be turned around? How can these things be done over? Lord, show us, God, what we can do. And the Lord took me to the passage in a particular example. He says that my people need to have a change of heart. That we can't point one. That's point one, by the way, if we can uh, write that down. That we need to have a change of of hard that in order for God to to free us and deliver us from this we, we first have to accept that our hearts need to be changed anybody knows that the heart can be very deceptive sometimes it can be very manipulative sometimes it can be very tricky somebody said back in the day that you need to follow your heart my god sister Sabrina if I would have followed my heart a long time ago my god I probably would have been strung out I probably would have killed somebody I probably would have been set it off y'all think y'all saw the movie set it off I probably would have set some things off I'm telling you if I would have followed my heart back in the 
day, my God, I would, I would have been closed up on some things. And so it is that our heart needs to be changed. I'm reminded of the particular passage when God, Jesus was out, he's ministering in a home. And then we see that this man who was paralyzed in his legs, he began to lay there, lying there on a mat. And while he's on the mat, four friends come up. They got tired of seeing him laying on this mat. They got tired, I believe, carrying him around. Sometimes us as friends, if you are a good friend, at some point you get tired of carrying around the weight of your friends. And at some point you got to let, let's have a talk, Sister Amy, because I've been carrying this too long and it looks like I care more than you care. And so it is that when they, their friends come together, they realize that Jesus is in this house and they take the mat and they pick up the mat with this man who is paralyzed. He had no mobility in his legs. So he could not get up and walk to the house to get his healing, to get his deliverance by himself. He needed help to get deliverance. And so what ends up happening, they realize they cannot get through the front door because there's too many people there. So they were really smart. They were really wise. They were strategic about this thing. I don't know how in the world, Sister Sharice, did these four men get this man laying on a map all the way up to the roof? Cut a hole in the roof. Lower the man down, amen, for his healing. But one thing I love about this particular passage is that they thought this man thought that he was going in for one thing, but God said that there was something much more greater. So see, the man thought that he was going in because his legs didn't have any mobility. But what Jesus begins to say that it is his sin, the, the, the evil in his heart, the sinful ways, the sinful heart of his is the very thing that kept him from getting his healing. So what are you saying, woman of God? What I'm saying is that God wants to heal us. God wants to recover us. God wants to restore us. God wants to repair us. But you keep holding up the blessing because of your heart. You keep holding up where God wants to take you because of the perception of your heart. And if your heart is in a particular type of condition, your mind gots to go where your heart gots to go. I know they said, my God. I know they said, well, well, you can still think if your heart is bad. I want to tell you today that if your heart isn't thinking right, your mind isn't going to think right. My God, because if your mind isn't thinking right, you can't get what God wants you to go. This is why we started out the particular passage in Philippians 4 and 8. You got to think those things that are just. You got to think those things that are lovely. You got to think those things that are right. You got to be reminded of what God and the promises of God that God has told you that he was going to do. And because I need to change my heart. Is a daily prayer. It's a daily request of mine. Because if I don't change the condition of my heart, what happens is every generation after me is going to struggle with the same type of ailment. Every generation after me is going to struggle with the same type of disease. And this is why my children, this is why your children look like it. This is why, this is why the family dynamics can't get it right. It's because the condition of our hearts so I told the Lord it got to stop here it got to stop here I made up in my mind early in life that I cannot do it I won't be another woman with nine kids because that's what happens in my family amen no no offense to my family but they were used to having children after children after children men after men after and I made up in my mind that a stop here, the generational curse stops here. If man couldn't do it, do it for you by the fifth child, baby, it's time for you to turn and look at God. So I made up in my mind that I'm gonna look at God for the things that I need. Somebody say I need a change heart. I need a change heart because it's the man that God is expecting for me to walk in. I, I, my heart got to be changed. I can't be thinking about what Susan and Mike did to me last year. I can't think about what that ex-husband did to me. I can't think about what my friends did against me. I can't think about what I like. I can't be concerned about what they got on social media. I got to be focused and be prepared about the domain that God has required of me. Somebody said I need a change hard. 
I need to change my heart. I need to change the condition of my heart. I'm not preaching to nobody, my God, but I'm preaching to myself because if I don't change my heart, Sister Amy, your breakthrough can't come through it. If I don't change my heart, Sister Sharice, you can't get fully delivered. If I can't change my heart, my mama can't be the mother she's supposed to be. If I don't change my heart, my home won't feel like a home. My home will feel burnt to my home, will feel chaotic. My home will feel stressed out. My home will feel not like a place of peace. I got to change my heart because my heart is where I store things. My heart is the place that if I cannot get this thing changed, God can't use me. God can't minister to me. God can't give me the strategic plans. Because what will happen is your heart, if you keep it where it is today, when God is trying to minister to you something, you will think this not it can't happen for you. You will be thinking that it, you know, you're not smart enough. You will be thinking that there is no way in the world because of the condition of your heart this is how we get healed from this paralyzed place that we are in this is how we are healed from the change of our heart God deals with us through our heart he deals with us in our mind and you don't want to make sure that everything it is that God is giving you that it's aligning up with the word of God and if it's not aligning up with the word of God then you might find yourself and if you are there I am praying for you I I am praying with you because I know what it means to be in a place where you reject everything because you don't trust the messenger. You don't trust the people. You don't trust a lot of things. And trust first starts with the heart. It starts with the heart. So Jesus asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Why are you thinking that you will be able to get up from this mat and walk. And why? The friends, they have the same type of mindset. No, I got to change the heart of a man. So when we respect the authority and exercise proper domain, we don't have to worry about whether people respect us or not. Because God says, I am going to take care of them like he did with Moses. In the 21st verse of Exodus, the fourth chapter, he says, I will make the Egyptians respect you so that when my people leave, they will not go empty handed. Moses was afraid that he wasn't going to gain a respect from such a leader in an area that he grew up in, a culture that he grew up in. He didn't think that he was going to gain a respect, but God said, I got this. Somebody said, God got this. So as believers, we have the obligation and the mandate and the commission and a holy responsibility to reclaim and recover the land in which God has given us. So you can't live a life of godliness without respect. And so this is why you don't have to worry about whether or not people respect you because God is going to position them and position you in a place where they will be able to respect you. You don't have to wish evil on people. You don't have to pray evil on people. You don't have to hope evil on people. If you continue to live right, God is going to have them come back to you. I've had people come back to me 15 years ago for something they did. And you know what I, I did? Because of position of my heart I was able to forgive them and move on and act like if you saw me and the individuals together you'll be like ain't nothing ever happened but I tell you there's a different experience there the second point I want you to understand is what apostle began to talk about he said that we need to be able to get into this experience so my second point is you need an experience Woman of God, what is an experience? What are you talking about? I need an experience. You're saying I need to change my heart. Now I need an experience. Yes, this experience is a testimony. We need a testimony because in our testimony is where the glory of God is glorified through our testimony. We are able to proclaim his goodness through our testimony. We are able to acknowledge his ways through our testimony. So we need an experience from God. This man who was paralyzed, he had an experience from God. So as we're going beyond the garden, I want to take us to the story 
of Moses. And I know you're like, why are we going to Moses if we're talking about Adam and Eve? I promise you, after reading the passage, after understanding this particular story, it makes so much sense here of where God is hoping that we get to so that we can move on from this series. Amen. So Moses, his birth, it takes place in Exodus, the great Exodus of what they say. Moses was a prophet. Moses his life was ordained by God. And many of us know the story of Moses, how at that particular time, the ruler, the decree of Pharaoh, what he had said was he wanted to make sure that because of the, these Hebrew boys, they kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And because they kept growing, what he began to decree, it says kill off. He wanted the midwives to kill off every male child. And so because the midwives they were loyal to God because they trusted God, because they believed in God. They couldn't do that. So what tends to happen is that Moses was able to escape. His mom hides her, him for such a time, and for about three months or so, he hide, she hides him and then takes him and puts him into a basket and makes the basket waterproof. And while he makes the basket waterproof, he puts, she puts him into this basket, put the, the baby in the basket into the Nile River. And once he gets into the river, somehow Pharaoh's daughter begins to see this child and takes the child out. As his own and what we know of the story is that the sister Moses's big sister goes and asks her does she need someone to care for this child she goes obviously and gets the mom and then Moses's mom is able to care for this baby and he comes up he lives in the home he lives and embraces the Egyptian culture but he's still a Hebrew boy and so what we understand for this particular passage as I'm traveling on over to this, the close here is what we understand by this is that some of us are still trying to figure out our lives. We're still trying to figure out what's going to happen. What should we do? What do we need to be doing? And God is telling you that he has purpose for you, that if he's kept you this far like he did with Moses, Moses could have drowned as a baby. A lot of things could have happened to Moses as his upbringing. There are things and different stories that if you read the particular story of Exodus, you will find so many things that he should have been killed. There are some things that could have happened to him, but God protected him. And so whatever decision, whatever thing that God has given you, God is protecting you on this journey. And so it leads us to the third chapter. God's presence as a savior was evident in Moses' life. Moses' parents saved him from death by hiding him in this basket. And so it is that we understand that just by this, that uh, what he had done, what he struggled most, we know that there's a particular story around the fourth chapter that talks about how Moses is actually um, intervenes from a fight from an Egyptian and a Hebrew man. And he intervenes. He has to murder this Egyptian man. So he was struggling on the inside as well as on the outside. He was struggling on the inside who he is, who he was. Amen. And he also had to deal with the things that were going on externally. And for us as people, we might be struggling on the inside because we can't see anything good. We can't see anything great. We can't see anything big because of who we are or who we connected to or where we come from. And so we make that uh, to be the depiction of who we are. But even in that, when, when he's struggling between this particular thing, there were miraculous signs that he was able to see at least 40 years. And God speaks to him and tells him to go back. Somebody say, go back. Moses have to go back because he runs away because he has killed a murder. He basically murders this Egyptian. And so he is running away for his life, right, for 40 years. And God tells him to go back. There are some things that God is calling us to go back to and deal with. That there are some things that we know that God has ministered to us. And what we have done is we have shut it off and we just moved on with our day-to-day -day lives. But there are some things that the word tells us that we're going to have to go back and do our first works over. So we got to go back with a different type of um, meaningfulness this time around. This time around when you're going back and you're proclaiming and you're taking on the assignment that God has given you. You're going back with a certain type of passion because he left 
Egypt as a fugitive, but then he came back as a leader. God, is, you have left some things. You've walked away from some things. You didn't have meaning of some things. But God is allowing you to go back, and you're going back this time around as a leader. You're going back with a certain type of persistency and consistency, and you're going back with a certain type of decency now. Because God now has ordered you, and now you're following into what God has called you to do. God is the type of God that he can make things that look bad and appear to be bad, and he can make those things good. And every time we try to do it with ourselves, we mess it up. We give up. We get frustrated. <laughs> you know, we want to walk away from it all. But God is like, listen, stay here. Deal with this thing. Repair some things. Some of us have to go back and apologize to some things for some things that we have done. Well, I don't like them pastors here, so they're just going to be my enemy. Pick up that phone and apologize for some things. I didn't say you had to go back and be their friend, but you can surely go back and apologize. You can go back and do your first works over. The Bible says, Revelations 2 and 5, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The Amplified Version says, so remember the heights from, the, from which you have fallen and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will and do the works you did at first when you first knew me. Otherwise, I will visit you and remove your lampstand, the church it impacts from its place, and unless you repent, we have to repent, people of God. Would you do me a favor and stand on your feet? There are some things that we are just going to have to do over. We have been paralyzed for too long. Our lives, the things that we do, is supposed to be an example of who God has taken us to, where he's taken us, what he's calling us to. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'm trying to get there. This place is not a place where God has meant for me to be forever. This place is not a place that you are supposed to be forever. There are some things that God wants to do in you, but we have allowed for too long rebellion, running away, rejecting authority. Now we're starting to look so much like the other generation that God had talked about in the word. So we got to repent. We got to turn away from that thing. Exodus 4, and I'm going to end here. The Lord said to him, who have gave man his mouth, who makes him de deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it, not, is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. During this particular time when we're asking God for deliverance and that God will repair us for certain areas of our life, realize that you don't have to worry about what you do not have to do the work that God has called you to. God is the one who makes the mouth. He makes the mouth speaks. He makes the deaf mute. He has total control, total power. And if we understand the position of God, we understand his authority, we will respect it. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that we received on this morning. We found the error of our ways. And we know that there are certain parts of our lives that we just have to do over. We know that we got to change our hearts, Father God. We know, Lord, that there are some things in us that are just not right. And we know, Father, we've tried our best to suppress them for too long. We've tried them for so long, Father God, to try to fix it ourselves. And we realize that we cannot do it. So we need you, Lord. We need you to do these things for us. And we know that, God, in this, with you, Lord, we have to have some sort of experience. We need a testimony to be able to tell the people, God, I know you're tired of the same old testimony. That when you remove things from our lives and you've blessed us from one area in our lives, you're going to continue to do it better, God. You're going to go higher and higher. You're going to go to glory to glory, God. So, God, we repent, God, on this morning, God, for treating you like we've treated people. We repent, Father God, on this morning for thinking, Lord, that you did that years ago. 
And that's all you meant to do for us. So we pray, Lord, on this morning as we open our hearts and our minds, Father God, to hear from you better. We pray, Lord, that you would show us, God, how to have that type of spirit of humility that when you speak to us, we hear you. That we don't leave this place the same. That you will begin to iron out every crooked way in our lives. That you'll make us a better versions of ourselves, Father. We've molded, we've created our personalities. But you called us, God, to have dominion. So we pray, Father God, on this morning that you would show us, that you would download, Father God, that in the name of Jesus, strategic plans to get to what you have accomplished, want us to accomplish in this life. We pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that we will learn, God, how to have an ear to hear. That we will be wise, Father God, that we will learn how to just shut our mouths, God, to receive from you, God, and go forth in you, Lord. We pray right now that you're changing hearts around in this place. And we thank you, Father, right now, God. We pray against that somber spirit. We pray against that stale spirit. We pray against, Father, that spirit that makes them believe, Father God, that they cannot go in you. We believe, Father, that you're doing it for us, your people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for the word. Thank you, Father God, for the word. Why don't you rejoice for the word that you received on this morning? Anybody got in their spirit, Lord, I realize why I've been paralyzed all this long. I realize now, God, why I have not grown. I realize now, God, why my marriage isn't what you want it to be. Because you have expected it to get the glory, God, in the name of Jesus. I realize why my family, Father, in the name of Jesus. Anybody understand this morning now? I realize that everything that I do, everything that I have, it must, God must get the glory in it. If my business is producing but not giving the glory to God, it's all wrong. If my makeup isn't giving signs that all glory belongs to God, something is wrong. If my attitude doesn't reflect the Father, something is wrong. If my preaching doesn't reflect the Father, something is wrong. If whatever I do in God doesn't reflect the God, my God, something is wrong. I've been paralyzed for too long. Anybody want to war with me on this morning? Anybody want to go there with me on this morning? Christendom has been paralyzed for too long. Jesus, my finances have been paralyzed for too long. My family dynamics have been paralyzed for too long. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Restore us, Jesus. Restore us, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank With everything inside of us, we say, We have a grateful heart for everything you 